begin our time of worship.
We gather every Sunday and we sing of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, the birth of Christ. It doesn't need to happen in a Christmas season. It doesn't need to happen at Resurrection Day. We can sing of the death and resurrection of Christ every Sunday. That's why we're here, because Christ has risen from the grave. So let's sing about that this morning.
may be seated. Morning, Moran. Guys, guys, normally we have Steve Boslaw up here doing announcements, but he is off and suffering for Jesus in Arizona currently, where I think it's 75 and sunny. I mean, you know, nothing, nothing to do there, you know. But we got a few announcements, and we definitely have some prayer requests this morning. So uh, we will have Sunday school after our small group discussion time, where we go through the content of the sermon and then discuss, discuss what the, we discuss the word on Sunday mornings. Tuesday nights, Brothers and Bibles meets 6 p.m. there. We go, we eat pizza, we go through scripture, and it is a just a good time of fellowship. Uh, Wednesday night, Bible study, prayer, 645. Sunday night, this Sunday night, there is no hollowed square for tonight. Uh, normally, we lead in the back, that square back there. We sing praises unto the Lord, and we learn how to do music better. Uh, upcoming baptism membership class. If you have not been baptized scripturally via immersion and you would like to be baptized or you're checking out Berean and you would like to be a member of our church, uh, it's the same class that's March 12th that will be during the Sunday school time. Um, we do have a, a birthday today. Is we're celebrating a birthday for Miss Joy. She's 95 and there will be a cake outside during our time of fellowship we do have some praise and prayer requests as well. We praise God for Diana McLean. Recent CT scan showed that her treatment is working. So we continue to pray for her. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for our government leaders. And I have one that I'm going to throw in here as an audible. Uh, one of my best friends in the entire world, who's a pastor out in Iowa, he has a, uh, he has a scan tomorrow for potential cancer. So please lift him up. He's having some difficulty swallowing, and I just pray for him. He's one of my best friends in the whole world, and yeah, he's one of my soul brothers. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pray for the offering. We're going to have the men come forward, and uh, yeah. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, we thank you for your church. Lord, I thank you for our ability to worship. Lord, we thank you for the cross, that you lived the perfect life, died a brutal death in our place and for our sins. And Lord, I pray the, for this offering. Lord, I pray that you would sustain your church. Lord, I pray for the prayer requests. And uh, yeah, I pray that everything would be pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' good name. Amen. So while the men are going back there, if you wouldn't mind opening your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, we're going to be here this morning in chapter 6. We have a lot of work to do today. Now, I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna, if you're, you're just tuning in, if you're just now getting into the book of 1 Corinthians, let's recap where we've been, what this book is about, and then, and then we will get into it. Amen? Amen. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and actually pray one more time before we get into the word. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, we thank you for the word. Lord, I pray for, Lord, I pray for myself that you'd hide me behind the cross so that the people of God would hear the word of God and nothing more. Lord, I pray that you would empower your people with the word and the spirit to live righteous lives, that we would live according to the text of scripture. And it's in your good name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I went to public school, so this means there's five more chapters before chapter 6. One, two, three, four, five. I can count. See, check that out. Now, we find out in the book of 1 Corinthians, this is a little church with big problems. I don't just mean like it's overinflating, making a mountain out of a molehill. No, this church has, there's some jacked up people in this church. 
Now, we find out in this book that discipleship is messy. I say this every week. Discipleship is messy. We are, sanctif- we are justified one time before God and progressively sanctified the more we walk with Jesus. Amen? Some people that walk is really long and you have a lot of stuff to clean up. Sometimes Jesus is, and the Lord has protected you from much sin and that road is shorter. Amen? That, that, long, that path is sometimes more difficult. Amen? Now, this context of chapter six, we find out the problems that this church was having. This church was having problems in division, right? Everyone's got their own team jersey. This guy's of Paul. This guy's of Apollos. This guy's of Jesus. Like, we find that this division is because of their worldly thinking. They're not thinking like Christians. And I'm going to make a side point here. The biggest problem we have in Christianity is Christians not behaving and thinking like Christians. Christians, right? Makes real sense here. It's why evangelicalism is in the state that it's in. We find out last week that that there's sexual problems in the church. A man is having a sexual relationship with his stepmom. We talked about church discipline and Paul chastising these believers for not expelling the immoral brother. There's a reason churches should practice church discipline. Now, As I said last week, there's a problem of sin. Sin never stays contained. Sin is like cancer. You can't just have a little bit of it, let it go unchecked because it eventually will spread through your entire body on an individual level. And in a church, in a corporate level, if we leave sin unchecked, it will spread to the entire body. So what we do, this is the reason why churches practice church discipline. This is the reason why you should practice self-discipline. And this is the reason why we should be pushing everyone on toward Christ. Amen? Now, we find out that there's even more problems in chapter 6. Right? I feel like a Billy Mays commercial where he's like, but wait, there's more. I joked with Steve Boslaw during Christmas. And I, want, I, w- I wish he was here because he'd, he'd laugh at this. You know the Frank, gold frankincense, but wait, there's myrrh? that. Now let's go ahead. Let's read our text as we normally do. And then let's pick it apart. So let's begin in verse one. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous, unrighteousness, unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, Are you too incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle disputes between brothers? But brother goes to goes to the law against brother and that before un, and that before unbelievers to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you why not rather suffer wrong why not rather be defrauded but even you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Now, let's break this apart. Let's look at the first few verses of this text. So what's going on? What's going on in this text? The the Corinthian church were suing each other over civil disputes. Someone's going to the law. They're being very litigious here in this section. Now, I want to point some things out here. One, these disputes that Paul is chastising them about were, according to the text, civil matters. Brothers going against brothers. These are civil suits. And there's a reason I point this out. This is extraordinarily important when it comes to this text for for two main reasons. First reason, because people have abused this text to say churches shouldn't go to the state for criminal matters. 
This was the argument several years back with the Catholic Church and their priests abusing little boys. The reason that they, they were like, well, it's a church matter. We should deal with this inside the church. That's why they shuffled priests around like people playing old maid. Like, we're going over here, we're going over here. It is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Sometimes during, sometimes, here's, here's the God's honest truth, guys. Sometimes we practice church discipline. So we discipline people and we call the cops. And we call the cops. The state has a role in, in society. And the other thing, which I kind of alluded to just now, there are different spheres of sovereignty in society. And one of the things that God has given us with the state is the state is to deal with criminal matters. Criminal matters is what they should deal with. Now, I want to get, we're going to give a course here, like a crash course here in a little bit, but I do want to point some things out in this text. Now, why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Because the Corinthians were going to the state when they could have handled the problems themselves. Now, here's a good question. Why is it better to go to the church than go to the state in these matters, according to this text? Well, one, the state is ungodly. The state in this text is ungodly. Now, Paul is really clear with this. Really clear, not just in the later half of this text, but even in the first eight verses when he says that... The case is made up of unbelievers in verse six, but brothers go to the law against brothers and before unbelievers so that the sin, this whole sin list that we see in the, the later section is referring to the state themselves. Now, with the state being ungodly, do you know what this means? This means that they're incapable of giving a just biblical judgment. It, you can't give a biblical judgment if you yourself are not biblical. Amen? Like, it's kind, of, it, it's kind of like saying, you cannot give something that you do not have yourself. Without a biblical framework, the state cannot render justice because justice is a biblical concept. And I'll give you a modern example of this with our state because I don't know about you, I think the state currently is pretty corrupt. Pretty, we see all the sin list that we see later on. This is going to give too much of the sermon away. We see this currently in our state. I'll give an example of this currently in modern times of the state trying to pursue justice, but actually gives injustice. I don't know if you guys have heard the concept of the prison industrial complex, right? Say somebody commits armed robbery. Say, God forbid you go out to your car after service. Someone sticks a gun in your face and says, give me the car. And we call the police, the police take this person away, right? That's a good thing, right? Now this person gets put in prison, gets put in prison, gets fed three times a day. And you as a victim actually get victimized twice. Not only did you lose your car, this person stole it, and you, and you also get robbed of your tax dollars as you pay for this person to be food, fed, housed. You're victimized twice, twice, that's terrible. Biblical justice in the Old Testament would say, well, this guy's going to go work off his debt toward you. That's a vastly more just system where you're not victimized twice. Twice, that's terrible. I don't even want to be victimized once, let alone twice. That's awful. Now, here's the other part. So the state is ungodly. They cannot give a godly judgment and it's not part of the state's job. They're to deal with criminal matters, and this is, a, this is a civil matter. More on this here in a moment. Now, the other thing is why the church is most competent to handle this dispute. Do you know why? Anyone want to take a stab? The church should be godly. The church should be godly and able to render a godly judgment. This is actually why in this text, Paul shames them. Paul shames them and says, can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle disputes among brothers, but brothers go, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers to have lawsuits at all with one another is already to defeat for you. If there's lawsuits going on within your church and there's lawsuits, someone suing someone else, that's a shame. That is shameful and brings reproach on the name of Christ. It brings reproach on the church and it brings reproach on the, the gospel itself. Now, 
The other thing too, a church should be biblically informed enough to make godly judgments, right? Remember I said a moment ago that the state can't make godly judgments because they're not godly. I know it's it's rocket science here, but the church should be godly and have a biblical framework so that we can make godly decisions, right? You can go to your brother who is having a problem saying, brother, he needs biblical advice, brother. This is what the text says. This is what God says in his word. The locus of authority doesn't rest on me. It doesn't rest on you. It rests on God. It rests on God. We need godly wisdom for our lives. Godly wisdom to settle our disputes. Amen? Now, here's the other question. What should the members of this church do instead of going to the state? Right? If it's this bad, if brothers are suing brothers, what should the church do according to this text? Be wronged, be defrauded, according to verse 7 and verse 8. And the reason, there's a very good reason for this. But brother goes to law against brother, and that, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your brothers? Church people should not treat other church people this way, primarily because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on the same team. This is one of the things that bothers my soul when Christians are wicked to other Christians. We're on the same team. We worship the same God. We worship we have the same Father, same standing before God. We should treat one another as Christ, as Christ would treat us. Amen. Now, Paul says to suffer them and be wronged. You know why Paul tells them this? Paul tells them this because there's worse things than actually being defrauded. There are worse things than being defrauded, than getting your property taken away. Like I said a moment ago, this brings reproach on the church. This brings reproach on the people of God and brings reproach on the gospel. How many of you guys... I just want you to think for a quick second. How many of you guys see a Christian mess up publicly in the news? What's the first thing you see? You see non-Christians right here ready to rub Christians' nose in it and say, look, see, this guy's a hypocrite. Look, see, this means Jesus isn't, isn't legit. This is what happens when Christians do wicked things. It makes a spectacle for the whole world. We should, the church should be better than that, amen? Now, the other reason why Paul tells them it's, rather, it's better to be defrauded, whom are they trusting ultimately to bring judgment? I want you to think about that. God, God is the one who ultimately brings justice because God will judge everything at the end. Here's the cold, hard, sad truth of this life, brothers and sisters. We will never, ever give perfect justice 100% of the time. This is the reason, this is a side note here, this is the reason our legal system says it's better to let innocent people go free than to be harsh and execute people that didn't do something because ultimately we give final judgment to God. This is what our founders believed, that ultimate justice, ultimate, ultimate justice is given by God at the end of days. We have to trust that. Amen? We have to. We have to trust that in church discipline cases. We have to trust that in legal cases. We have to entrust that. And we have to know that one day our advocate will give us perfect justice. Now, I want to put this text in proper context. This will help understand this whole concept of sphere sovereignty and the different systems that God has put to function in society. Now, this is just a crash course of, this is a crash course in sphere sovereignty. And I need to address this primarily because this text deals with two individual groups. This text deals with the church and this text deals with the state, two of the three spheres of sovereignty. Now, it is necessary to address this because currently Christians don't think in this paradigm. We don't. 
And we haven't for some time. We used to think like this, but we no longer do because within evangelicalism, we've not had to. We currently, uh, through recent events, this kind of idea of sphere sovereignty is being rediscovered. Now, what is sphere sovereignty? There are different spheres in society that deal with different governance. For each sphere, God has given Uh, them both a role and a means to accomplish that role. Each sphere of government has certain things that they are responsible for. And yes, as you can see in the diagram, there is some overlap. Now, let's deal with one of these spheres first. Let's deal with the sphere of the state. The sphere of the state. Well, what what is the role of the state? Punish crimes and evil. Criminal matters. Also, I would chuck on here that you can put civil defense in something like the state, right? I don't declare war in my own household against my neighbor. Nations declare war against nations, right? We're praying for peace currently in our current worldly situation right now. Now, where do I get this idea? Where do I get this idea? I get this idea from Romans 13, 1 to 7. Romans 13, 1 to 7. Let's look at this text. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For before For because of this, you also pay taxes, and for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all to whom what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect whom respect is owed. Do you guys see what's going on in this text? Do you know that the actually in the original language where it says the the magistrate is God's servant? Do you know what word that is? A pop quiz. The word deacon, dikaianos. You know what we call people that serve in our church as servants? Deacons. These people are servants of God and should behave godly in their roles. Now, what tools, I'm just giving you the basic overview. This is like a 30,000 foot flyover. What tools has God given them to execute their roles? What tools? We see here, we see taxes, They can levy taxes against citizens to raise funds to carry out their responsibility. And I want to point this out, especially about taxes, because I just got mine done yesterday. And, you know, taxes is like going to the dentist. No one likes doing that, but you got to do that or bad things will happen. Amen. Now, here's a weird thing about taxes. Taxes, people think the government just gives things away. Well, Government, this is one of the things I majored in, government can only get revenue, in two, our current government can only get revenue in two different ways. They can get revenue in taxes, which is one, which is taking it by force from the citizenship. You don't pay, like with taxes, it's not like a voluntary thing. If you don't pay your taxes, it'll put you in prison, right? Not a fun experience. So taking it from their citizenship or debt, like issuing of bonds and stuff like that, which is a guarantee of future taxes. Check this out. So really, there's only one way in which the government can fund themselves, which is taxes. So when the government gives something to one citizen, it must take it from another. This is, uh, if you are interested in this idea, this concept of how government and stuff works, I recommend the works of a man by the name of Thomas Sowell. Highly recommend his works. I don't know if he's a Christian, but he is a very sharp thinker and will definitely challenge you on your ideas of commerce and government. Now, so they can levy taxes to raise revenue, to build bridges, to do their job, to pay for the ministers of the government. Now, what is the other thing God has given them? God has given them power of the sword. Huh, interesting. What is the sword? Well, the sword is a vivid imagery of the state has the ability to execute capital punishment and end the lives of those committing crimes. 
we most assuredly know how the apostle Paul died. Paul, the apostle, was, was killed and he was beheaded. Why was he beheaded? Why do we know he was beheaded whereas Peter was crucified upside down? Well, Paul was a Roman citizen and crucifixion was only reserved for the worst of the worst. So Paul would have been beheaded and what would they have used? A sword to execute the death penalty. Now, the reason I bring this up, especially amongst Christians, people would say, well, capital punishment isn't biblical. Of course it is. Capital punishment is something God has given to the state magistrate to restrain sin and execute laws. Now, so we have the state. We have another institution. We have the church. What is the church? What is their role? The church deals with matters, with church matters, calls people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what tools has God given the church to execute its, execute its roles? Well, one of the financial aspects is offerings. God lets the church take tithes, offerings of the people of God to pay for ecclesiastical things like buildings, uh, missions, ministries, salaries, those kinds of like the lights and stuff like that. This, I mean, DTE, we get a DTE bill every month. Like this, God has given us this ability and this responsibility and blessing. Now, what other thing does God give the church to execute its responsibilities? We went over this last week, church discipline. The church can't excommunicate a member of the body of Christ who is constant habitual sin. The church, notice here, the church does not have the ability to execute someone bodily. You ex the church excommunicates people of removing them from membership. The church is not given the sword. The state is given the sword. The state does not have the ability to excommunicate somebody from the church. They're separate spheres of sovereignty. There's definitely a distinction going on here. Now, there's another one, the home. The home. Well, what is their role? Building godly families, raising children, building households to the glory of God. Who is this comprised of? This is comprised of husbands, wives, children. And here's the tools God has given the family. God has given the family the ability to enter into commerce with one another. Uh, getting involved in business, trades, other economic activities. Note, I want to point this out. Biblically, you know what the most biblical form of Commerce is most biblical form of the way the economy is structured, capitalism, because it it rests on the idea of private property. You own things. You don't. Biblically, we have private property. If you can if you can be arrested and you can be charged with theft, means you took something that did not belong to you, that was not part of your private property. It's actually very interesting because in capitalism, do you know where the 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 uh, means of production? land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, talentship. Do you know where those live? In the household. They are owned by the household and the private citizenship. The prop, the, another aberrant, I'd say unbiblical form of economics, like communism, do you know who owns those? The government. Capitalism is biblical. Capitalism is extraordinarily biblical. Now what... Uh, to execute and enforce their authority, what has God given the family? The rod, the rod. God has given the family the rod. Now, what do I mean with the rod? I mean the ability to administer corporal discipline to their children to get them to comply. We see this in Proverbs 23, 13. I got a few things on Proverbs of discipline of children. Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him and do not set your heart on putting him to death. Proverbs 22, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Spanking is a biblical concept, guys, not to be done in anger, not to be done out of wrath, but spanking is a biblical concept. This is the reason why the world hates it. This is the reason why the world gets up in arms over it. This is something God has given to the family to ensure discipline for their children. There's ways to do this right, and there's yes, there's ways to do it wrong as well. But this is something God has given to the family. Now, now that I've laid out all three things, there's the church, there's the, the, 
the state, there's the home, all three thing, all three different spheres of sovereignty. I have to point this out because every time I lay this out, there's always questions. Oh, always, always questions. Now, here's some important questions about these spheres. What happens when a sphere abdicates its responsibility or breaks its covenant, right? What if one sphere is completely out of control? What do we do? Well, that sphere inevitably destroys itself. That sphere destroys itself, becomes dissolvable and reinstatable within its sphere. Here's a key point here. Each sphere does not have totalitarian uh, privileges, right? If a state is tyrannical, it can be reinstated with a new state, for example. Uh, like government. When a government no longer punishes evil, it can be thrown off as illegitimate because it no longer standing on, it's no longer completing its biblical role. Believe it or not, historically speaking, do you guys know this was the exact argument that our founders used against England? Not that they were rebelling against the government, but they were like, they're an illegitimate government because they're not being biblical here. That was their argument. Now, I'll give you an example with the church. When a church condones sin and acts unbiblical, it becomes apostate and eventually will close. A church, God closes faithless and fruitless churches. This is a God, this is truth. This is happening within mainline denominations right now. This is happening because they've lost their salt. They've lost their ability to preach the gospel. There's nothing different. There's no, a mainline worldly church denomination you should not waste your time with if they're just, a, a worldly person is not gonna wake up early on a Sunday morning to go get the same stuff they got at the club last night. They're just not going to. There's nothing different. There's no salt. There's no light. This is why we herald the gospel, guys. This is why we say, repent and believe. Turn away from your sin. Trust in Christ. We need to be salt and light to a preservative and uh, illuminating with the word of God. Amen? Now, the home. The home. And this is horrible because I've seen this over, I've seen this many times. When the covenant of marriage is broken, like adultery or abandonment, which is the biblical outs that someone had. Like if so the adultery and abandonment are the only biblical grounds of divorce. It can be dissolved and a new household be formed. Paul, uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, I went over this with my guys, that if somebody commits adultery, divorce is unfortunately on the table. A dissolving and breaking of the covenant. Now, so here's another question. What happens when a sphere takes over the responsibility of another sphere? Like, what if some sphere's not staying in its own lane? How many of you guys have driven on the road, like currently on 275, as I'm, as I'm having a flashback from this morning driving to work, as people are not staying in their lane, right? Guy in a Mack truck, I'm over here in my, I'm over here in my cop car just driving, because I bought it because it was cheap and it's awesome. And he's over here halfway in my lane, and I'm like, what are you doing? This is my lane. I only got a little bit. Don't take it. Now, what do you do? What happens if they get over in someone else's lane and they try to take responsibility? They mess it up. Every time an institution takes a role that's not given to them, it messes it up. It messes it up. Each, and here's why. Each sphere is designed to get smaller and smaller and smaller and deal with more small problems. When I was a kid, when it, we, so we moved to Mount Morris when I was in sixth to seventh grade, and we had this cool thing in our house called a fireplace. I was a slight pyro as a child, so I loved the fireplace. I would try to set things on fire, and yeah, can we build a fire? No, you're weird. Don't do that. I don't want you to burn the house down. But we had this thing that, that it was sitting over in the corner that had a whole bunch of fireplace tools. You guys know the tool of the poker? That was awesome. The shovel, I didn't like that one too much because I mean I had to clean the thing. And we had this other thing that went like this and was like Jaws called fireplace tongs, right? They were for when this thing was screaming hot, you grab a log and you can put it on the fire without burning your flesh off or singeing the hair on your knuckles or anything else horrible that would happen there. Mind you, yeah, I experienced that a few times. Now, here's the thing. Those fireplace tongs were massive, like massive tweezers. Could you imagine trying to take a splinter out with fireplace tongs? 
That's not going to go so well. It won't grip. It won't, take, it won't take care of the thing. It'll take your finger off before it takes the splinter out. Not a very fun experience. Now, when a bigger, so there's a reason we go from state to church to home. Do you see there's a natural descending order? The state's usually big. The church is usually a little bit smaller than the state. And then the home is much smaller than the church. They deal with different things differently. I'll give you some examples where different spheres have screwed things up. Government and social welfare. Welfare is to be handled by the church and home per Romans 13. It's not given, as the go- not given to the government. We should do good things in the name of Jesus. We personally should take care of our friends or family uh, when they're down on their luck and they need help. The government raising children. Nobody wants to go. I don't want the government raising my kids. I d- flat out don't. That's not, I have memes and stuff like that that say how bad current, <laughs> the current state of the government is with children. Here's another one. The church discipling children. The church should aid in discipling children. But the church is not the primary discipleship mechanism for children. Do you know where that is? The home. Because you know your kids better than I ever will. If you're looking for the perfect youth group, you should stop. God has already made the perfect youth group by giving a a father and a mother to discipline and love that child and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord per Ephesians 6.10. Amen? This is, the, this is the problem even in evangelicalism. The reason why uh, we have such a problem in evangelicalism is we subcontracted out the discipleship of children from the parents to the church. And that ought not, that ought not to be, brothers and sisters. We need to take care of our own, own kids and preach the gospel to them. Yes, the church does help for sure. For sure. Uh, I'm not against youth group. I'm not against all those other things. But it's more of a supplement rather than the meal. Right? If you live on nothing but vitamins and water, you're probably going to die. Or vitamin water. I mean, that, that probably has no vitamins in it. Sorry. Bad analogy. But, but that's the truth. If you're not eating real food, you need to have real food, and there should be just a supplement. Now, how does one sphere deal with another sphere when it crosses its boundary? This is going to be slightly controversial, so I want to be very careful. Defiance and disregarding their supposed authority. Now, I'll give you an example as to why this is. Why is because they don't have the authority to do what they're claiming that they're doing. This would much be like me going to your house. Say, you invited me over. Pastor John, you want to come over to the house? Sure. Hey, I'm going to go tell you what to cook for dinner now. I'm going to go ahead and rearrange all your furniture. And you guys are going to be like, you're never coming to my house. Ever, ever. All that invite just got taken away. I won't do that. I'm usually like, I'm, I'm very chill. But... Here's an example. We actually see this working itself out in society. Uh, last a couple years, a couple years now. Wow, it's been it's been a minute since COVID. One of the massive blessings of going through COVID was a reignition of people thinking biblically about sphere sovereignty, especially in terms of the government. We haven't flexed those theological muscles in hundreds of years. Now, previously, during this, before the COVID thing, pastors would just say, yeah, Romans 13, you do whatever the government tells you to do as long as it's not sinful. Ah, uh, not exactly. Not exactly. Now, COVID, they'll give you some places where they've overstepped their bounds. COVID lockdowns, the government tries to tell the church you can't meet. You don't have the ability to do that. Guess what? We're still going to meet. As long as I've got air in my lungs, we, got, we, we can still sing a cappella. We're still going to meet as a church. We're still going to preach the scriptures. We're still going to worship Christ. I don't care if you put a fence around here. We'll do it outside in the parking lot. Tough, tough giblets. We're going to do it. But respectfully, go pound sand. This is what it is. Now, I'll give you another one. And I'm not, I'm not trying to pick fights. I'm not trying to pick fights. This is another one that I've seen, and I'm trying to be pastoral. I'm trying to be sensitive. I'm not trying to stick my foot in my mouth. Church mask mandates were another way, I think, that they, there was an overstepping of bounds. Now, this is, this is going to ruffle feathers, and I love you, but I'm just trying to be biblical here. Churches can't add requirements for people to come to worship. You can't add requirements. Arbitrary requirements. I don't, we found out masks no longer work. Current, we found masks didn't work in the first place. Now, we found out that, like, I'll give you another example. Take the mask away for a second. Let's just say the elders, we all got together and we decided, hey, everyone 
has to wear a yellow shirt to, to church on Sunday. We're all going to have, you're forced to wear a yellow shirt. You don't get a yellow shirt, you can't come in. We don't have that kind of juice. I don't have that kind of juice, guys. I don't have the ability to make biblical ways of worship and stuff like that that God has not commanded. We don't. This is the, we have to be biblical in our worship. God gets to define what worship is, not you, not me. God does. How does he do it? Through his word. This is the reason, this is a side note, this is the reason why we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Like you'll notice even, even today, I think we're singing a couple hymns later, right? We're singing a couple hymns. You know why we do that? Not because we just like old dusty music. And I do like old dusty music. I like old dusty everything. I like antiques and stuff like that and kerosene lanterns and fountain pens and just cast iron sky. I love it all. The reason why is because God said that in his word. We have to listen to the word. Now, let's look here at the rest of our text. So that's sphere sovereignty. That's, that's it in a nutshell. That's a crash course. There's much ink that has been spilled on this. Let's look at our text in 9 to 10. Now, which ungodly people is Paul referring to here? The people that are... Uh, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Who is this referring to? The unbelieving state that Paul is saying you shouldn't go to. This text is specific. I mean, they're, they're interconnected. The state around them. This is the reason why I mentioned earlier that the state was unable to give a biblical judgment because they're not biblical, right? Now, I want to make some observations here. This sounds a whole lot like the state of our country, right? This sounds like if you turn on the television, you could check this off like you're playing bingo, right? Greedy, yep. Drunkards, yep. Swindlers, yep. Will not inherit the kingdom of God, yep. Yahtzee, done, win. Like, seriously, right? You turn on the news right now. You turn on your phone and YouTube and do this. Uh, don't do that right now because we're, we're, having, we're having church. Now, here's the thing. Don't be surprised or fret about the current state of our nation. God is sovereignly in control and, will res and can rescue his people. God will always have a remnant. Always have a remnant of the righteous. We feel like things are, we feel like everything's going down the toilet currently, but our God is strong. Our Christians have been in this position before. Yes, it's a travesty, but our God is sovereign. Our God is in control, and we have to we have to stand on that. Now, here's the other question here about these ungodly people. What does Paul say will happen to them? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you know what this means? Not everyone's going to heaven. I'm just going to level with you guys. Not everyone is going to heaven. This is the saddest part about going to funerals, especially people that don't know Jesus. You go to funerals and they're like, they're in a better place. I don't know. I mean, if you didn't love Jesus, you're definitely not in a better place. It's definitely, it's pretty hot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. But here's the truth. Not everyone's going to heaven. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. All these people, if you're not in Christ, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. It's not who you will marry, what school you will go to, like where you'll spend your retirement, what vocation you will have. The most important question you will ever answer in your entire life what will you do with Jesus Christ? Will you repent, turn away? He who lived the perfect life, died a brutal death in our place and for our sins, lived the life that you could not lead, died the death you deserve to die in your place and for your sins. Will you repent and believe? Will you repent and believe? That's the most important question you will ever ask. Paul says here, the only way to get, through, get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. My favorite verse, and one of, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture is in verse 11. Do you guys see what Paul does here? Paul talks about a new life in Christ. There is, there's four, five words. Such were some of you. Do you know why this is one of my favorite verses? Because it tells of a, it tells of a clean slate in Jesus. The only way we're cleansed is through Christ the only way we're cleansed. And you know what this verse tells me about the makeup of the Corinthian church? One, there, there were people in their church that committed all of these sins. 
Every sin listed here, Paul probably could go to one of the members of their church and be like, you committed this, you committed this, you committed this, but you were washed clean in Christ. You were washed clean. The gospel had so clearly changed these people that they were made of the, the, the people from the world around them were so cleaned by the gospel. They were from sinners to saints. Now, I think it's very interesting too. This text explicitly says that there were former homosexuals in, in their church. There's a Greek word here, arsenokoitai, which is uh, both partners in a homosexual union. This is why, honestly, I categorically reject the idea of orientation because when you're washed in Christ, you're a new creation. You're not bound by your old sins. You may struggle, but you're not bound by those old things. You're made new in Christ, and we must, we must have a rock-solid view of the new birth. Do you know what impact this text should have on us, guys? especially this text, all this, this sin list. And then Paul saying, such were some of you, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God. This should cause us to herald the gospel even louder because God saves messy people. Let me tell you the truth. There is no one you've met in your entire life. How many of you guys have met messed up people? How many of you guys are messed up yourself? I got both hands up. Like Seriously, it's how it works. There's no one so messed up, God cannot save them. If you're here today and you're like, I've wrecked my life. Good, God's looking for you. God wants to hear the gospel for you to repent of your sins and trust in Christ. That's the message of the gospel. It can change, the gospel can change anyone. There's no one so far gone that you cannot repent and believe the gospel as long as you're still breathing. We should be sharing the gospel. We should be heralding this message because if we want people to be saved, there's a ne the necessity is to share the gospel with them. If we want to see society transformed, we have to share the gospel. We have to be busy going about preaching and proclaiming this message wherever, whether at the water cooler at work, whether we're playing in a cornhole league community band, wherever we go, whether you're at Harbor Freight, I don't, wherever, there's people that need Jesus. Also, this should impact us by saying we shouldn't be shocked when people in our church are made up of the people around us. People have sinful pasts. There's two applications here. One, this kills our pride because we're all sinners in needing of a savior. There's no holier than thou attitudes allowed in the Christian life. If you are, if you are in faith in Jesus Christ, you are a sinner saved by grace and grace alone. There is no chutzpah you have to say, I was awesome. No, you were wicked. You need Jesus. Every one of us does. There's equal footing at the cross. Every one of us needs Christ. Now, there is no swagger that Christians can have and saying, well, I was better than that person over there. No, clearly you're prideful and clearly you're not better. Now, this also should radically, so this should kill our pride and this should radically shape how we view the new life, the new birth. That if someone is in Christ, all their old sins are passed away. You're a new creation. You're a new creation in Christ. The new birth, the new birth, guys. You get the reset button on life in the gospel. Now, if you're here today, if you're here today and you've, you're hearing this gospel message of Jesus Christ and you're like, yep, yeah, I've committed every one of these sins. Like I, I, I'm one of the people listed in here. There's hope for you. There's hope for you in the gospel of Christ. Repent and believe. Turn away from your sins and trust in Christ. That's what repentance means. Repentance is a, is a term where it means 180 degrees. You're going one way, you're running off the cliff in your own destruction. You turn around and you trust in the perfect work of the Savior. That's what repentance means. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I pray for us that we would embrace, the, that, we would, that we would love you. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would meet you. Lord, if there's anyone watching this that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would meet you. And Lord, I pray that they would have their sins forgiven. And they would trust in Christ. And Lord, I pray for us that do trust in Christ and those that do know Christ. 
would know you, love you, worship you, and serve you better, and that we would think biblically in all of all that we do. It's in your good name, Lord. Amen. Well, would you please stand, and we'll continue our time of worship. Um, like he gave example of, we're going to be singing completely a cappella, that is voices only. So please raise your voices. Um, I've done this before, but I know there were a couple people confused. So when churches do it this way, I'm going to give the first little bit of the song just to give you an idea of what tune we're singing. And then I'm going to follow that by the starting note. And we'll go on from there. <clears throat> this is Psalm 1, Selection A. Da 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 That man is blessed who does not walk as wicked men advise, nor stand where sinners meet, nor sit where scorners pose as wise.
Romans 16, verse 25. For to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go serve your king.